This is Ryan Roth. Welcome to the Bright Talk ESG podcast. This is an interview I did with Martina McPherson, and to highlight how extensive her credentials are, here is a list of what she has done and what she is involved with. Martina McPherson is the founder of SI Partners Limited, an independent consulting firm specializing in extra financial risk management, legal and compliance, training, and research and analytics solutions. Martina is a writer, lecturer, public speaker, and trainer on ESG and sustainable finance, and regularly contributes to industry and academic publications. Martina is a doctoral fellow at the ICRMP in the UK, a visiting fellow at Henley Business School, and a guest lecturer at University of Zurich teaching ESG, green finance, corporate governance, and risk management modules. She sits on a variety of sustainable finance working groups, boards and panels to assess and report on the status of the market, policy, and product innovation. Martina also leads a global not-for-profit think tank, the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets. This is a social network for the next generation of sustainable finance, banking, and insurance experts. Over the last two decades, she has held a range of senior global research, product, and business development roles at S&P Global, Hermes EOS, MSCI ESG Research, and within Product Strategy and Lloyd's Banking Group, Insight Investment, RBS Asset Management, FNC, and Deutsche Bank. Martina holds an MA in Law and Social Sciences from the University of Frankfurt in Germany, certificates and affiliations in Asset and Risk Management, as well as in Corporate Governance by the IMA, ICSA, ICRS, and ICRMP Institutes in the UK. She is an alumni fellow of the German National Academic Foundation and of eFellows.net. Now to the interview. Martine McPherson, welcome to the Bright Talk ESG podcast. Thank you very much. Um, So, A, thank you for coming into Bright Talk's offices. Um, This is our second episode. I'm very excited to hear about your breadth of experience. You've done a lot of different things over the year from working at MSCI to doing consulting. Um, I want to start by talking about a book that you wrote, Mm -hmm. talking about a a very specific species um, within this this sustainability. I think it ties into sustainability. So it's called The Business of Bees. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? Very good, very good question, Ryan. So that was actually an idea that uh, came from a, a dear friend of mine, a scholar and lecturer at University of Sheffield at the time at Henley Business School, Jill Atkins, mm. and she and her husband Barry have been researching species uh, and species extinction topics for God knows the last twenty years. She's also done other work in areas, you know, like governance. So she's one of the co-writers of the King Code of South Africa. Very exciting. The King Code. The King Code, literally the Code of Governance in South Africa. And hence, you know, her studies led her from governance, I think, into more of the broader area of accounting, which is her background. And then natural capital accounting became a natural fit because ultimately, you know, there's a lot of species extinction in Africa, specifically South Africa, as we know. And Mm. ultimately, we then all got together as a group of individuals through collaboration over the years, engagement efforts, ESG research, activities, networks, and we as a group supported actually Jill in making that book happen, which was published in 2016, Business of Bees, and it talks about the decline and the financial and economic impact and consequences of that decline of the pollinators, specifically the honeybees. Mm -hmm. Why is... Hey, why, why was honeybees a thing that's so important? There's like a Netflix show about this. Bees seem to be everywhere. Um, are they a, a kind of like a critical element in the ecosystem? Absolutely right. They're absolutely fundamental to the food chain and food mm. system, food ecosystem as you've classified it. So it's estimated by Greenpeace in 2013 that 265 billion US dollars mm. are actually at risk because they are linked to the pollination that's actually undertaken by okay. natural pollinators such as the honeybees. And hence, you know, this is very much a financial sure. and economic risk case, yeah. not just obviously uh, a controversy when you, you think about ultimately yeah. the, the rapid decline that we have seen over the years of yeah. that specific species and the species in that, in that context. Okay, well thank you for that kind of that analysis. Um, can you bring me back to when you first got interested in these like 
large cause ideas and getting involved in them? Where did, where did your interest come from? Another interesting question, Ryan. I think um, it came, or it was actually derived from multiple sort of triggers or, or factors. Ultimately, I started working in the field of sustainable investment, sustainable finance, almost now 20 years ago with my first role at FNC, Asset Management, where I worked closely um, with the stewardship fund management team at the time that was SRI, Socially Responsible Investment, and the RIO, the uh, Responsible Engagement Overlay team. And actually, it triggered my interest in this area, the specialization in this area. And I continued working in between, you know, mainstream asset classes and then with an ESG overlay or SRI overlay for a couple of years, ultimately until the financial crisis hit. And uh, I was working for HBOS at the time, ultimately the merger with Lloyd's, it's, the rest is history. I've seen ultimately governance scandals and sensed and, and felt them very personally. My husband worked for Lehman Brothers, mm. another huge, obviously controversial yeah. factor at the time. So um, I've actually got th into the area through interest, specialization ultimately at an early stage in my career, but also ultimately supported then by the various triggers and scandals that we have seen, especially in the financial services sector. Okay. What did that prompt you to want to do? It so sounds like the, the financial crisis was, it wasn't just like, as it happened to everybody in the world, something that was there, but if it was like, it was much more personal for you. Mm -hmm. What did that prompt you to want to do? Mm -hmm. Just get more involved or what? Good question. Definitely getting more involved, um, challenging, disclosing controversies, mm -hmm. providing information, education, knowledge exchange. That's something that's very close to my heart and always has been. I partially studied um, law, hence, you know, human rights and specialized in the areas of more what is now classified as the social issues and social sciences. Hence, very early on through my studies, I already got in touch with a lot of the controversial activities that are happening, mm -hmm. more from a legislatory, regulatory perspective, potentially, but ultimately then looking at that from an investment slash research and impact perspective. And again, you know, looking into certain areas, may there be environmental challenges, may there be social risks, may there be governance scandals, mm -hmm. has ultimately brought me, I think, back to the area where I initially started, and hence, you know, led to maybe through my work with MSCI, as you mentioned, and many others that I've actually worked with as a consultant or in-house, actually led to the fact that I got really a wholly rounded picture of what's currently needed to ultimately provide sustainable finance action. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm delighted to see that with many of the groups, regulatory or, or say, slash mandatory or voluntary activities that are happening in our space now, we are really moving to a holistic picture of a, a truly integrated approach when it comes to policy making, when it comes to corporate activities, and when it comes to investment action. Mm -hmm. And hence, you know, being part of that and being part of that for the last 20 years, since literally inception of the PRI, sure. when they had, you know, in 2006, just four trillion of US dollars assigned to them by their signatories, I worked for one of their first signatories and was involved in that movement. And hence, you know, now looking at over almost 80 trillion US dollars commitments in sustainable investment and sustainable finance and looking at the latest developments when you look when you look at for instance the responsible banking principles which I also had the the honor to to co-launch in Paris last year yeah um, I think we have come a long way from initially a very activist advocacy agenda to a real holistic perspective when it comes to ESG integration and that includes all the various approaches as you know from screening from integration to engagement and ultimately now beyond. And I've seen a lot of product innovation in this space, which really makes me comfortable that we have now really entered the mainstream. You, you Just now you mentioned a, a, a process. It was screening and then something and then something. What, what was that process? So literally, the traditional approaches for social responsible investment, they literally predominantly looked at screening. So mm. negative screening, oh, I see. screening out controversial yeah, activities. Yeah, we don't want tobacco, <laughs> we don't want fire up, things like exactly. that. Exactly, okay. exactly that. And then you moved with a PRI, the six responsible investment principles, you actually moved into the second stage, which was integration of ESG factors. Mm. And that's now widely done either as um, a thematic approach, for instance, or as a, a specific factor-based approach, even interlinking increasingly on the product side, ESG indicators and factors with financial factors. I've seen that a lot, you know, with quality of value, momentum, the typical financial factors and integrating and overlaying them with ESG indicators. So is, 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 is that approach. like 
looking at it from the investment point of view or like from the point of view of, of creating a company using you know this, maybe you have like a I don't know a recycling plan something like is that or from what angle does that emanate that, that integration emanate very good question I think you, you you need to differentiate still you know there's obviously the corporate approach yeah. and a corporate perspective and that's very often uh, denominated towards disclosure and reporting and you have increasingly though now a focus where you talk strategy and top-down approaches yeah. and that's mandated you know even by the again responsibles for respon uh, responsible Principles for yeah. responsible banking, apologies. They mandate even an approach that looks at strategic, transactional, and operational elements, mm -hmm. you know, across an organization, a bank integrating ESG. Okay. But then you have ultimately the other element, and that's the investor side. And here we talk about ESG integration in investment decision making, yeah. predominantly in equity markets. But you know, we have seen it over the years now in fixed income, in increasingly also in alternative assets, you know, infrastructure private equity and the likes. Yeah. So integration of ESG factors, environmental social governance factors is actually increasingly happening now across asset classes and across the investment value chain. Yeah. So this phrase ESG, right? It's a very popular phrase. Um, some people maybe know what it is, environmental social governance. Can you give us some examples of how a company might integrate a social factor or a governance factor because it's easy to say we have the environmental factors you can kind of point easier to those but what are the social factors and the governance factors that companies can can consider in creating a company or in investing in a company mm -hmm. very good question so increasingly I think the debate around uh, supply chain man management oversight which is an, a social or socially linked topic is a okay. key S issue for organizations. So understanding the ESG risks, opportunities and their impact, very often also classified if you look at the two elements, risk return or risk and opportunity as net impact, is something that companies are obviously getting increasingly aware of. And some of the key reporting frameworks, even the UN Global Compact in its wider context and sense, is looking at incorporating not only the operational company's perspective and looking at their own operational risks, but ultimately supply chain risks. Yeah. And that is a key element when you look at um, social risk um, indicators and factors. Then you have an ongoing topic which is increasingly important, which is human capital. That's actually predominantly to do with employees and the workforce. And it has all connotations and links with areas such as diversity, may they be gender, age or ethnic diversity and related risks and issues and looking at our globalized world and the companies that we all work in and how the companies are operating in a global context understanding the implications of a socio slash multicultural context of that organization and where it ultimately operates mm -hmm. is an absolute prerequisite hence understanding human capital factors and risks and where and how they occur is again an absolute prerequisite for investors to understand and even for companies to benchmark themselves yeah. against their peers. So the social aspect not only includes like, I'm just thinking about what does a, what, what, what programs can a company have mm -hmm. that make sure that they are um, thinking about uh, a, a social aspect of their business, right? Maybe that may manifest in a HR program, right? Today in our office, it's, it's Pancake Day because Tuesday was Mardi Gras. Um, maybe that's an element of that. And, and maybe that um, leads to a more productive workforce, right? Which, is, which leads to, you know, because it's, it's happier people, they're happier to come to work, and they are more profitable that way, right? Um, but for, and, and a governance point of view, maybe there, there is gender equality, right? And they are and there's there's racial equality, right, mm -hmm. or, or diversity. You know, are these how these things manifest in a company, mm -hmm. or are there other elements to that too? Well, in the first instance, absolutely. I think one point you just made is also important: the interconnectedness of the social and the governance issues. So, yeah, how yeah. companies are run. You know, you look at corporate culture, you look at organization design, you look at even roles and responsibilities and how they are configured within this. This is all the way of how a company governs itself. And you look at this also from two aspects, maybe there's the board level and the senior management and the direction, strategic leadership as we very often call it. Yeah. And then there's participation and maybe also distribution, when you look for instance at the gender figures, of how the workforce engages with the top, what the tone from the top mm -hmm. is, how it engages with that tone from the top, and how ultimately best practices are implemented. Okay. And this is ultimately, right, this type of discussion around intangible values and how 
sure. companies, right, are differentiating themselves from their peers again. You've seen that with the major brands investing a lot of money in reputational management. And ultimately, again, just to maybe specify that, ESG and ESG risk classification frameworks look at the wider spectrum of intangible values slash intangible risks, you mm -hmm. could also say. And that includes reputational risk, operational risk, ultimately the extra financial matters as a whole. Yes. And this is exactly right where the S and the G issues are getting interconnected. So coming back to your question, absolutely right. There is one element that investors and researchers are increasingly focusing on, and that's the type of level of engagement and participation that you see at a workforce level. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, all the different type of initiatives and programs you're describing are actually creating brand loyalty, trust and value. And these are the values, again, which we as employees aim to, to see and to actually aim to live and actually breathe on a day-to-day -day basis in order actually to feel committed to an organization. Sure, sure. And that's a trend, right? You've seen all of us are still in this area of being at least heavily impacted and influenced now by the millennials. And the millennial workforce and the value values of the workforce, I would call them, which increasingly include you know, the next generation of leaders, I just had that discussion yesterday, is actually expecting a much broader offering from organizations that actually includes that level of engagement yeah. and commitment than what we have seen maybe the last 20 years. So from shareholder value to stakeholder value, and that's a current and ongoing theme. What is the difference between stakeholder and shareholders in this case? So when I started off um, 20 years ago as an analyst, I was always told, ultimately, the Milton Friedman theory of the 70s. A company is here to make a profit. Yeah. Um, so it was all about providing shareholder value. And you know, ultimately, here I see the conundrum, which has been now widely explored in our area, because it's not just about the shareholders in the organizations that have their assets ultimately, clearly have an invested interest via their assets that ultimately direct the, 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 the strategic direction of the organization. Now, I think it's important to understand that you have got clearly the shareholders and investors, but you also have got the employees, you have got the suppliers, you have got the, the wider value chain within the organization operates. And that's a sort of a, a, a prism that Accenture actually had put together, the, the stakeholder value prism that actually describes on how these different parties interact mm. and how you need to give sufficient emphasis to all of them in order to run an organization that's for the long term successful and sustainable. Okay. And hence all these elements of sustainability, long termism mm -hmm. and strategy are ultimately intertwined in this wider context of where we started human capital management. Yeah, so the difference from what I'm hearing is that stakeholders versus shareholders. Stakeholders are everybody involved in, in the procurement and creation of value, mm -hmm. whereas the, the shareholders are the people that own equity, right? So they are, so there's a guy in the United States, he runs the Union Square Hospitality Group, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of restaurants in New York City, his name's Danny Meyer. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book called Setting the Table where he talks about this concept called enlightened hospitality. And he's like, the last person that I'm thinking about is actually the person that walks in and eats. Because if the cooks are happy, and the waiters are happy, and the farmers giving me the vegetables are happy, then I know that the customer is going to be happy, right? Right. Everything flows down to the final product and the consumer. But if everything is, is positive for everybody involved, the product will be that much better at the end of the day. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know, and you're keeping and maintaining your core asset. Yes. And these are your people. Yes. That's, which is usually one of the biggest assets. Correct. Um, I want to go back again. You were talking mm -hmm. about your work at MSCI. Mm -hmm. And I recall from a previous conversation we had, you were fairly instrumental in creating things at MSCI. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? I just want to, okay, good. Still going. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, tell me about the, the work you did at MSCI and, and I think it kind of pioneered some work there too. Tell me about that. Very, very interesting time actually, that time at MSCI. So I joined MSCI uh, over the course of 2010 mm -hmm. at a time when they had just literally acquired the, the major two building blocks of their now ratings and index offering. So KLD 
and Innovest. Mm -hmm. Innovest actually was the fundamentals for MCI's ESG ratings product and KLD for their ESG indices, which is now part of their broader mainstream index offering, as you know. And factor indices, we briefly touched on factors, and the alignment of, even of ESG and financial factors is one of their latest developments, mm -hmm. which is also an exciting thing to see. So MSCI, absolutely, when I joined them, um, they were undergoing a transformation from the service provider for financial services only into fin extra financial services aligned with you know ultimately the wider offering that they had in place and um, yes we came up and I was part of that development of five people really at the core we came up with the initial purpose alignment and product innovation that you now see is, is distributed across their their ranges of, of offerings and ultimately that meant coming up with an aligned approach for the ESG ratings, mm -hmm. research and ratings proposition, I should say, and ultimately the ESG indices. And then as a next step, aligning them with their wider offering and integrating them into models such as Barra and other risk and portfolio management platforms okay. that are now clearly also fundamental for investors to make a strategic decision and asset allocation when it comes to ESG integration. Okay, what did, uh, so, what did the process of creating the, those frameworks look like? Were, 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 you, were you taking, um, actually, were people asking you to say, we need to create something? Or was it, this needs to happen, this will have a marketplace? Was it, was it internal or was, it, was it there demand? Supply and demand, yeah, it was actually a bit of both. Let's face it, in my first conversations actually with Bear Pettit, who now is the president of the organization, a fantastic individual, and a very uh, forefront and cutting edge thinking individual. Um, he actually and I discussed, should we actually come up, first of all, with a terminology and a definition? Something that follows me in this space up to today, because there's a lot of confusion around the different type of frameworks, taxonomies, even metrics being used. Yeah. And one of the first things were, uh, that we, we did actually, we sat down and we defined it should be ESG. And the question was, why ESG? That's an abbreviation no one will understand. I said, no, on the contrary. Look at what you're creating. We're creating a global approach to a new type of concept that's been there in the context of maybe ethical investing, SRI investing. We're not just duplicating or replicating. We're trying to make a new point here, building ultimately a new brand in this space. Mm -hmm. And if you look at BMW and some of the other brands that are using abbreviations, especially because they are denominated by origin, like Bayerische Motorenwerke, right, BMW, ah. denominated being German, the whole wording itself would have been too much for anyone sure, to digest, sure, sure. right? So you needed, first of all, to come up with terminology, yes. a brand, and ultimately building and, and, and establishing a concept that would be easy to digest already from the word go. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. what we did. So that was one of the first things of how we described ultimately what's now widely used in the industry yeah. as terminology. We, we made that stance and set in that commitment. We're calling it ESG1. So that's kind of the heuristic that you use because it's much easier to, like you said, BMW rather than the other word, exactly. which I couldn't even understand. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. So that's a good way for people to automatically say, this is what you're talking about. Boom. So right. first you've created that Top of the tree, I guess you could exactly. say. Exactly. And then from there, we ultimately really looked into what we had in place when it came to the different type of data streams. Mm -hmm. As you might know, KLD's data is and was widely used in the industry, but also actually in academia, because they had a longer standing track record when it comes to ESNG information slash data. And KLD is what? Uh, KLD was a Boston denominated. Um, <laughs> Um, um, ESG Research House, and mm -hmm. they delivered their first, one of their first approaches in the early 90s. So just going back in time a bit, the, the early 90s, you saw you know, a variety of different ESG Research Houses springing up that are now quite still prevalent to this day. So you had KLD in Boston, you had Innovest in New York, mm -hmm. you had ultimately here on the side of the, of this side of, of the equation, you had, and you have Iris, Ucom Research, which is now part of ISS, and by the way, ISS at the time was part of MSCI as well, so that's oh. how they, the whole market is very intertwined and interconnected itself as well these days. And you had obviously ethics in the Nordics and GES or engagement in the Nordics and a couple of other houses here and there. And ultimately, you went through major phases of consolidation, 
of these type of different ESG research and rating approaches. One was the first level of consolidation which happened ultimately with um, Sustainalytics, Yancy and Sustainalytics ultimately went together and became that firm. You then had the consolidation at the same time, roughly slightly after uh, MSCI, buying risk metrics and risk metrics having bought KLD and Innovest. Ultimately, that was the platform that we had in our hands and to play with, to operate with, to yeah. build an integrated new ESG research and ratings data stream that was a continuum from what was widely used in the industry as the KLD data because of its track record, and yeah. that's hence why it flowed into the indices, and ultimately the ratings data information that came via the fundamentals of, of Innovest. Yeah. This is going to go on a tangent, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll loop back in a second. Yeah. So KLD is a, do they aggregate data or how do, is it a platform or? Correct. So the ESG research houses such as KLD, yeah. they literally it, collected yeah. data. Sure. They collected data on publicly listed companies predominantly, yeah. slightly changed now these days. Initially a remit of 700 companies roughly, maybe even less, probably 300 then 700 over time and ultimately now the ESG research and ratings data encompasses the ACRI, so more than the MSCI World Index, and far beyond that, you know, a, a multitude of different different type of assessments, bespoke and non-bespoke, mm. for also mid-cap companies, mm. and I understand even the non-listed space. So, but historically, it all started with a small set sample of companies that were assessed based on their environmental, social, and governance credentials, broken into various these three pillars and then underlying levels of ESG factors, criteria, indicators, metrics, however you want to call them, very often used simultaneously, yeah. but meaning the same thing. I'll give you an example. So for environmental, you looked, for instance, at climate change, or you look at natural capital. For social, as we said, you look at um, factors such as supply chain management oversight, human capital, human rights and labor rights connotations. And for governance, likewise, closely interlinked, Ucom's research methodology, by the way, takes the S and the G in one pillar, historically did, because they are so closely aligned. And there you look at everything from board to corporate governance, what we discussed a bit earlier. Okay. And these type of methodologies, it's very interesting. Um, I did an assessment in comparing various approaches. Um, clearly over time, they're very, very, very closely now map and match each other. So there is an interesting conundrum here. And I think this is what the EU Sustainable Financial Action Plans framework for ESG is now trying to overcome is that there's a massive amount of overlap between the different type of approaches. Yeah. It's just a slightly different level of IP that's yeah. put on every of them. And that's what ultimately you get and what you pay for. What do you mean by a slightly different level of IP? So literally slightly different type of metrics okay. or underlying data points even yeah, better so yeah. that are utilized for the assessment. And then clearly you have different approaches. That's fundamental. Comparing for instance an UCOM research with um, say an MSCI or Rubik or SAM with an MSCI and others. So you either have a, a, um, an absolute research and ratings approach or a relative research ratings approach. That means you're either comparing a cross sector or by sector. Mm -hmm. And that's the major factor of differentiation here when you look at comparing apples with pears. So yeah, say. yeah, exactly. Um, oh, so now I'll look back. That was my, my apologies for the tangent, but I wanted to clarify what, um, what it was. The so you were you were creating this framework kind of a heuristic around ESG and how you could um, make that a more well known phrase. This is 2010 at MSCI. Mm -hmm. From there, where did you go next? It's very good. So I stayed there for the four years, which were literally the fundamental years and really building and shaping this market. And I yeah. think everything took off from there, it's fair to say. Yeah. So I then started setting up my own company, yeah. working with other clients in the research and ratings field, such as Ucom Research and CSSP, which actually provides um, portfolio ratings for carbon and for ESG, working closely um, with, with MSCI, again, utilizing their data. Um, and then I started working with others, you know, asset owners and managers as well on assigned contracts, for instance, one of them being Hermes. Yeah. And that was a fantastic experience as well and journey working on the engagement team because it brought me back to some of my hi well, historic yeah. uh, experiences at FNC and working very closely in really mandating companies for change and working with many other um, asset 
owners and managers and even NGOs and activists on collaborative engagement initiatives. You know, for instance, human rights in the seafood supply chain, which was a big topic that came oh. up in 2015, or the introduction of the Modern Slavery Act, something that's followed me up to yes. last year when I got nicely recognized for being a top influencer of modern slavery and uh, a newly created index in that space. That all points back to the great pioneering work that's been done by Hermes generally, and then my contribution to it. And last but not least, coming back to the bees, one of the major engagement programs that I initiated was actually also on the business of bees case, yeah. ultimately bringing together other investors and the big companies, controversial companies in the context of pesticide production, distribution, Bayer, uh, BSF and many others that we actually brought together on, on, for a round table debate mm. to discuss for the first time openly here in the UK the challenges and also to ultimately opportunities linked to the usage of pesticides versus alternatives and opening really their eyes mm. for the again socio-economic and financial impact that's linked to the loss of the pollinators. And they, that was feedback from Bayer and others, they felt that this was a really effective way for them to better understand the issues and how investors are getting increasingly concerned about them. Something that about hadn't bees. even been, hadn't even uh -huh. been exactly um, at the forefront of their mind. They thought this is something that ultimately consumers mandate for clearly all of us, and fair enough, that should have already triggered them if you understand your stakeholder value prism well enough, Consumers, of course, are sure. part of it as well, right? It yeah. should have triggered uh, a step back from some of the historic approaches. But I think really what influences company decision-making became clear when I engaged here um, at Hermes with multiple companies, especially in the retail and apparel of food and beverage sector, consumer-heavy sectors, you can really make an impact if you're going and engaging with companies from an investor's perspective. Uh, so because... BlackRock is doing a similar thing in the U.S., right? Larry Fink, what, 2018, he's like, we will require most of our portfolio companies to have a aspect of ESG within their company or before we even invest in them, right? Something like that. He said something like yeah. that. Um, it sounds like you guys were doing this at Hermes before this was even said. Yeah. So, you would, so how, how would that work? How would you, how would you create those mandates? Mm -hmm. And what do they look like? Good question. So one thing maybe quickly to, to be noted, absolutely, BlackRock and others, the large scale fund measures are obviously on this track now, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, but definitely FNC, one of my first Simons, Hermes Investment, um, Eden Tree and many others here in the UK are really the leading investment houses yeah. when it comes to ultimately socially responsible or ESG investing. They have been doing this with dedicated engagement teams for many, many years. And therefore, it's, it's very important to, to make maybe also a bit of a differentiation between now the mainstream moving in, which is fantastic, and that's what we need, especially when you look at also passive investing. BlackRock, Vanguard, SSG, the largest passive investors looking into this topic now, which is important mm -hmm. because through cross-ownership, there's always been the discussion around is there sufficient stewardship of their assets and is that even possible yeah. through passive investing. But stepping back now, um, literally the, the leading asset managers in the field here, predominantly in the UK and a couple of Culver's and, and others in the US have been doing this now for almost 20 years. And uh, the way an engagement approach is, works actually is you define the key controversial topic slash aspects a company potentially or an entire sector might face. You're then ultimately looking and reading a lot. That's why it's called ESG research. It's for a reason because you undertake a lot of research on the organization such as in any other type of analyst capacity as you would ultimately do. You, you, this is in this context of being an equity slash ESG analyst. Sure. And you understand, um, or you try to understand, the financial impact, the cost to capital implications for companies linked to ESG controversies. Mm -hmm. So you would literally follow a three-step process. One is understanding the macro trends, ultimately how that translate into micro trends issues, like for instance an oil spill, right? And we are having the macro topic here, climate change or even uh, pollution. Let's put it in that mm -hmm. right context. So pollution and ultimately global pollution of oceans and then you look at oil spills. And then you would drill down into the cost of capital implications. When I looked at the BP oil spill for instance um, and um, the, the controversies not only linked directly to the environmental impact but also to the governance issues that you saw with the lack of you know, connections, communications between BP, Halliburton and Transocean, their key suppliers at the time, mm -hmm. which ultimately made that 
uh, or made the impact of that of that spill significantly worse. And you can very often, and this is something I would also like to mention, very often you can track and trace these ESG issues from one end of the spectrum, say from an environmental impact, back to a governance controversy. And that's very often what you see not only here with BP, but you've seen that with Volkswagen, you've seen that with many of the um, other type of scans that are out there, E and G and S and G very often are closely aligned. Yeah. And understanding that risk pattern is the role of the ESG researcher. So you have two types of risks, event driven risks, the low frequency, high impact incidents, and oil spill is a good example. Yeah, yeah. And that's it's it's not only low frequency, high impact, but it's a loud, loud thing because everybody in the media is picking it up. Exactly. And that's when it becomes really from the um, intangible risk, it becomes really a reputational, mm -hmm. a business slash operational yeah, risk, yeah, yeah. and that could lead even to litigation and other sort of consequences. And that's ultimately, yeah, a major impact risk. Mm -hmm. And then you have got, but very often they're connected, you have got the risk patterns that form over time. And uncovering these risk patterns of what I just described earlier as a VW scandal or BP scandal, understanding that there are different factors, not just only the environmental impact yeah. issue, at the end. Mm -hmm. That's the work of a successful ESG researcher. And then setting the targets for such an engagement means you're rolling out the story. You're going back in time and you're understanding what the different indicators were, the triggers, the data points that led to the crisis. Oh. And you're actually putting that down and you're setting yourself what we call engagement targets. And they might be, they're very often are, very closely aligned with actually the various controversies you've seen, mm -hmm. but also on the, on, the, on the upside, if a company has invested heavily in research and development and innovation and long-term thinking and strategy, yeah. then you would also take that type of positive level of, of, um, of, of, of company impact slash results into account, and you would try to mandate, and that's of course the, the ambition of a good engagement program as well, you would set a sort of, a definition of a, a nice best-in-class scenario of where the company should be mm -hmm. and where you'd like to guide it to over time X. Yeah. And what is very interesting to see is that some of the leading organizations were the same way included in an engagement program as the laggers because ultimately the leaders should drive and that's been the ambition and core focus of a collaborative engagement as well. They should help in driving the entire sector or industry to the next level. I just had an epiphany I think. Um, a, it sounds like this is what is meant by the integrated approach because E effectively touches S, which definitely influences G, and they all influence every, everything else, right? Absolutely correct. But at the same time, and at the same time, not but, um, when a company where investors are so important in encouraging that development because when they do mandate that companies stick to these guidelines, um, It'll be great for a reputation, reputational point of view because um, it, 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 it's great for branding, mm -hmm. but also it's, it's good in general. It's mm -hmm. great for branding. Mm -hmm. And if they are trying to reach a millennial audience, mm -hmm. which is increasingly more discerning about what is going into their products, mm -hmm. then in the long run, they will be much more successful from a, uh, a, a profitability point of view, a doing good while doing well point of view. Um, so it, it really, it, 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 it's driven by these investors, but also it needs to be embraced by the companies themselves too. Exactly, and you made two exactly, again, very relevant and important points here. One is obviously, this is specifically relevant to consumer companies. You know, that companies, yes. obviously, they have a direct impact on society. Yes. And that's again why the retail and apparel, food and beverage companies really understand their impact and the, the links to sustainability very well. When you look at a Unilever, when you look at an M&S and others, they are exploring and nurturing this field because for them the intangible value mm. is already a given. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other thing is about the millennial investors or millennial society that we all now actually are somehow part of. Absolutely right. In order to be successful over the long term, you need to understand the demand of your consumers mm -hmm. and these companies directly understand the stakeholder value prism mm. and comes back to the same point and they understand the consumer yeah. element. And I just had another epiphany. Mm -hmm. It's not only going to be the millennials that are going to be buying from you, but also maybe working with you and, and for you, right? right. Um, and they will be much more on board if you can demonstrate 
a, a adherence to these principles in general. Correct. That's uh, why you're closing the loop. Yeah. And that brings us back to ultimately, yes, organizations operating in this field as providing as well as employing the next generation slash millennials. Yeah. And that's ultimately the, the, the definitely the, the change that we've been seeing that the values investors, which include female investors, millennial investors in particular, and their appetite and their interest in these areas has really driven and catapulted the sustainable investment environment more generally also to the next level at both ends of the spectrum at a stock level slash corporate level, as well as at a portfolio level. Sure. And if you look at some of the research in this field as well, academic research, it's actually proving our point. So you've seen studies from Harvard on you know, corporate sustainability or also by a Deutsche Bank and University of Hamburg and others that looked at 2000 meter studies in this field. They all say the same thing. There's a direct correlation between corporate sustainability performance and corporate financial performance. Okay. Talk to me about NSFW or NSFM. Very good, exactly. So the Network for the First Sustainable Financial Markets, yes. the Next Generation Initiative. That's a topic very close to my heart. Um, it's actually an initiative, a network of yeah. um, sustainable finance professionals and academics um, that's been up and running, God knows, for more than a decade now. Um, one of the co-founders, Raj, actually, is now back on board with our latest Next Gen initiative. We actually um, have been involved in this network, myself personally, and as a president for the last couple of years. Um, for some time in pushing and driving discussions, knowledge exchange, product innovation even in the field of sustainable finance. And I'll give you an example, Climate Bonds Initiative, obviously the leading frameworks for green bond assessment was actually one of the initiatives launched by the network. Um, it became then a self-fulfilling and self-standing type of development. But many others in the area and in the industry, from Carbon Tracker and other organizations quite renowned now for their area of specialization and impact when it comes to ESG topics and issues, have been linked, directly formed, and obviously informed by the network. So we had a, a challenging period in 2018 because, as you can see, there are so many network initiatives and coalitions out there now yeah, um, yeah. that it becomes a very very hard to understand the yeah. market maneuver it yeah and to see even the, exactly <laughs> and to see even the benefits right of, of many of these initiatives don't get me wrong I think it's important for investors to get engaged collaboratively and to push many topics like climate action 100 plus is a fantastic network initiative by corporations and investors to get really to grips with the climate change requirements slash governance and strategic requirements, topics that are now out there in the space, but it's just one of many different examples that are, you know, Monterey Carbon Pledge, uh, Decarbonization Coalition, mm. uh, Transition Pathway Initiative, they're all literally initiatives in the same yeah. sector and field. Um, so why am I saying this is, so we didn't want to, with NSFM, to replicate a lot of these different initiatives that are already out there. Yeah. We had our longest standing uh, set effort and, and many, many years of experience in bringing in and bringing together these different groups in the industry for sharing best practices and we've done that via website, via listservs, email campaigns, even initiatives on the ground. But we have seen given the sheer vast of amount of initiatives out there, we don't need to actually do our own work anymore. What we should do is we should find a new purpose, focusing on the next generation and bringing them into our industry because what we have seen is so far the industry is becoming quite self-fulfilling and self-providing but how do you actually get into our field how do you find information yeah. when you when you're actually studying or even as a young professional and you'd like to change into the sector believe me there's no guidance there's no standard there is ultimately not even an apprenticeship program that's been set up like here in the uk you have uk government supported apprenticeship programs for many industries doesn't exist for our field hmm. So we got together in 2018 and said we need a rethink, we need a, a shift, and we need a purpose, and we need to focus on the next generation when it comes to knowledge exchange and information, mentoring opportunities, and career and talent management in order to get really the best in class and the wider community, the best in class people in our area and the wider community engaged on topics that matter, not only for sustainable investment, but the wider capital markets banking and insurance, very much in line with what we are seeing where the market is also developing mm -hmm. now when it comes to principles, standards and taxonomies. 
And um, we have now successfully launched the NSFM Next Gen Initiative. We're going on, I'm delighted here with Brightalk as yeah. one of our first knowledge exchange partners in actually focusing on another topic that's core to our heart and that's the sustainable development goals, yep. providing really a framework for environmental and social issues and engagement. And again, one of the first topics here that we are obviously now focusing on is diversity, gender, age, ethnicity. And again, the gender diversity or the diversity topic, apologies, in general is such a fundamentally intertwined and interlinked topic when it comes to the next generation, exactly yeah. as you had summarized, because this is about next generation investors, but also most importantly, next generation employees and how and when and where they will be treated equally is important from every type of context. So and this is ultimately what NSFM is about, is about interconnecting in the first instance, the next generation, and we're providing an online platform now via LinkedIn and very soon via a website, yeah. where they can find information, up-to-date research, all the information they can research and search in the public domain. We're trying to stream as many of our contacts into the network as possible. Mm -hmm. So they can literally all benefit from being also mentored and nurtured by experienced professionals in the field. And I've benefited on both sides as a mentee and as a mentor with the Global Thinkers Forum and with other organizations of having actually worked closely with the next generation and seeing this really as mutually benefit because ultimately both parties are learning by understanding, researching and sharing best practices. Yeah. Could be anything from content to ultimately product innovation. And that's what we're really trying to establish and working with third parties credible third parties in the space, Bright Talk, Global Thinkers Forum, Migrant Leaders, TBLI, just a few names out there that we are now interconnecting via the platform. And they all say, this is a great idea. You're not just reinventing the wheel by coming up with a new set of yeah, initiatives. Yeah, yeah. You're connecting us all and you're giving the next generation an opportunity to find out more about this space. So just I, I want to summarize mm -hmm. what you guys are doing because there are so many different groups and initiatives and programs and processes that that are going towards these these goals and this issue, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, because there's so many, it's 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 hard to know where to start. Correct. So this provides a way for people that are new to industry. Maybe they just got out of school, or maybe they want to switch because they're like, this is a really important thing. This provides them a way to figure out where to start, how to learn more, how to get involved, mm -hmm. and who the who, who is involved in this mm -hmm. in general. Correct, Already. the marketplace for ESG, Yeah. for your next gen okay. leader, hopefully. Okay, that's cool. Um, and we will link to this in the, the show notes of, of this podcast. Um, can you, so you mentioned the sustainable development goals, which you and I have talked about a lot, and we're, we're developing content about this. Um, why are these so important right now? And where do they come from, first of all? So they were established in 2015 yes. um, by the UN. And it's been a, a long-standing process and progress, actually, in developing them. You had initially the millennial, Millennium Goals that were founded and set up in 2000. Very similar goals, but obviously not overlapping in every area. And the major difference is here, this is not just for philanthropic and char charitable um, activities mm -hmm. and that's how ultimately the Millennium Goals initially were used and utilized. This is ultimately a framework that will enable investors and corporations to get a better grip on the key issues when it comes to environmental and social issues. Got it. Governance less so, you might think that partnership for the goals for instance, goal number 17, has also governance element by remit in intertwined within it sure. but ultimately you're talking about environmental and social governance yeah. uh, so environmental and social topics um, and it's very important again because you had multiple frameworks and taxonomies I'm always describing it from that shift from voluntary to mandatory frameworks yeah. that you're seeing now yeah um, and ultimately the codes the ISO standards the normative frameworks GRI reporting framework, IRC reporting framework, SASB and many others, very, very helpful. But again, a lot of information there in the public domain and a lot of confusion. I think people really like, and you said that earlier to me today, people like to simplify. Oh uh, yeah, I gotta simplify this. <laughs> right, exactly. And ultimately, I think the 17 goals help to simplify an approach that will work from a 
from a disclosure, a reporting, and an analysis perspective on focusing on the key issues yes. and how they ultimately impact the environment yes. or society at large. Okay. Um, just so I can make sure that everybody understands, um, you've said the word framework many times. What is a, if I were five and you were trying to explain to me what a framework is, what is a framework? <laughs> Good question. So a framework actually uses a variety of different metrics, criteria, indicators again, and creates a sort of a matrix. Got so it. that means for a, a research and ratings approach, most importantly, or even for a benchmark, you need yeah. a rules-based approach. Yeah. You need to understand which factors are actually relevant, how they ultimately will impact slash be weighted yeah. in the context of actually risk slash issue or opportunity on the upside. And then you will compare and benchmark them okay. against each other. So it's a way to kind of measure things and then mm -hmm. set standards by which those things should be measured. Correct. Right? A rules-based approach. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. That's that's very helpful. How how can investors and analysts become qualified to get into this area? Is that very good question. So at the moment, there is no standardized program. So what you see is in our area, which is quite unique, and I love this we are all universalists so not many of us have had a specialist training say in okay. financial services or social sciences or the likes no on the contrary we all come actually with a cross-border experience and this i think makes this area so rich and i hope that this is not going to change but there are of course now increasingly programs that will help actually individuals to get more qualified in our area and maybe certified so there's a PRI, for instance, which runs an academy, um, and you can qualify on ESG approaches, such as screening, mm -hmm. integration, engagement, and other um, areas. Then there are specific offerings by universities, which are actually programs, for instance, dedicated specifically around the SDGs. So there's an SDG coalition from academic institutions, Oxford, Zurich, that I'm denominated with as well, and others, that actually train you on SDGs. And there's even, or there are, various free online modules that I've now come across and seen supported by the UN and other organizations that also provide you with an insight in some of the major programs that they have literally um, established and are running, such as UN Global Compact as one of the leading normative frameworks, UN SDGs, the ones we've just discussed, and ultimately, likewise, GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, and IRC, the major corporate reporting frameworks are also actually providing training and background and context via free online training modules and obviously one-to-one -one bespoke discussions, mm -hmm. especially if you're new to this area, either from a corporate perspective, very often CSR, corporate social responsibility, or from an investor's perspective and obviously from an ESG research perspective. Okay. And this, is this what you were talking about yesterday at the Holt Business School? Okay. Correct. So yesterday we met with actually the next generation of young leaders, male, female, um, that are all interlinked with the Global Female um, Leadership Forum. Um, and they, this university has done something very interesting. They now picked a topic of how you, to educate the next generation of leaders. And looking at topics like I spoke on gender diversity, for instance, others spoke on um, leadership and decision making. There was something around understanding your role in the organization, have a word in your say, uh, sorry, have a word in your pay. So literally providing them with guidance and to, to overcome a lot of these conundrums and controversies that we have seen. And ultimately the university is now building this into a broader engagement building block that they're already offering in the context of sustainability, um, leadership and next generation planning. Okay. And um you're involved in an organization called Swiss Think. Mm -hmm. How do they work into this goal of educating people on, um, on, on gauging metrics? I think that's what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Very interesting development as well. So what we have seen here in this collaboration with Swiss Think and the founder Blair's in particular, he used to lead the uh, corporate ratings team at S&P. Uh, globally and um, over time he has realized there's a huge demand for credit analyst training because ultimately the training is not necessarily always provided by the organizations mm -hmm. themselves so he is providing this as third-party training to all the major credit rating institutions through discussions with myself and with many others in this industry here he has come across the ESG topic and he realized that ESG integration in credit rating analysis is becoming mm. a key prerequisite. Yeah. So another 
piece of the puzzle yeah. in the stakeholder value prism. Yeah. So ultimately the role of the service providers, that's now more well explored, but specifically the role of credit rating agencies and how they're interlinking between policy and regulatory decision making and investor sentiment as well as corporate um, ratings per se is obviously a key stakeholder puzzle that needs to be wider explored. So there have been initiatives by PRI to uh, provide so far I think three reports on the impact of ESG in credit ratings analyses and all the major rating a agencies have now employed in-house ESG teams but I can see clearly there is still a need for understanding and providing a bit of a context to these agencies that help them to understand a where and how they're operating versus their peers, but also what the major differences are, we're talking again around frameworks and taxonomies, sure. between a traditional ESG research and ratings approach and a credit ratings approach with an ESG overlay, because there are clear differences. So Swiss Think and my role within that will aim to provide clarity and transparency around major developments in the area, frameworks and taxonomies utilized, and help ultimately the credit rating institutions to build up and expand their current offering when it comes to an ESG analysis. Okay, um, thank you for that. I have a couple short uh, questions that I am trying to ask to all of the podcast guests. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'll ask them to you. Um, and these, are, these, these aren't ESG related, mm -hmm. they are uh, Martina as a person related. Um, how do you self-educate? Do you like reading? Do you like listening? Do you like watching? What do you prefer? All of the three. Oh, I wouldn't even be able to take preference one over the other. I think, yeah. again, I mentioned being a universalist, and that definitely applies to myself and the way I've actually trained myself over time with the help of others, clearly not only by myself, but yeah. hence I think it's important to learn, read, and listen. Okay. And that actually encompasses all the three elements that you've just mentioned. Do you like podcasts or audiobooks more? Or, or which do you listen to more? I think podcasts okay. and webinars. I find them more spontaneous sure. and up to date very often and not as static. You're right, you're right. Um, which podcast do you like? So I like the podcasts that actually provide information. Hermes has undertaken them with a radio station here in the UK okay. on sustainable investment trends. Okay. I've listened to a couple of them quite regularly. Um, I also like podcasts here when it comes to, um, well, webinars, I should say. Okay. Obviously, Bright Talks webinars, I listen to them quite frequently. Okay. And um, also actually by organizations, uh, MSCI for instance. I was fundamental in helping in shaping the ESG trends agenda that they're putting out as thematic context slash agenda for the year. Yeah. And um, so that's obviously still on and going and I listen to that every year and okay. in between to other thematic discussions that I put into the public domain. Okay. Jeez, you're you're like on theme all the time. Um, what do you what do you are have have you recently read anything or listened to anything that changed your mind on something fundamentally? You're like, I never considered that. Maybe it was a Netflix show, or maybe it was a documentary. I think it has to do with Brexit. Oh. It must have to do with Brexit, because I'm a Remainer, and I strongly feel, as a, as a German citizen living here in the UK, I'm yeah. still very, very impacted um, by the, the whole debate. Um, I tried, though, over time, you know, to understand better of why we have seen these results, yeah. and understanding the other side, Yeah. and um, now seeing that probably both sides getting slightly blurred when it comes ultimately to what's right and what's wrong and where do we actually sit yeah. and understand that solution can only be found between you know groups in society and even between the UK and the EU mm. is something that I think I, I'm still learning but I'm seeing now the two sides of the story and I hope in the interest of everybody here involved that we can find some type of consensus. Yeah. It's not just a one way story. And we will know very soon. Or maybe it'll be pushed back. Who knows? Who knows? Um, uh, what 100 pound purchase, 100 pounds or less, mm -hmm. has most um, affected your life in a positive way in the last six months? Well, uh, I have got uh, um, a newborn, and oh, yeah. I think literally. What's his name? Um, Aiden. Aiden, okay. Aiden, and um, actually purchasing now a, 
a bottle holder oh. that you can tack to a pram and to any type, of, <laughs> any type of equipment without having to stand for hours and ensuring that he gets the right feet. It's definitely for me been one of the best <laughs> purchases so the last couple of weeks. You had, uh, it's a, just over a month ago. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's just, just sharp in your mind. That's the best <laughs> thing. <laughs> that's great. So it's a bottle holder that you put on the pram or wherever you can. Exactly. It's easy. Okay. That, that was the that was best It's a recommendation. Answer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that was, that was the last question. So Martina McPherson, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge. And we went through a lot of stuff today. Um, we are going to be doing a webinar on the 20th of March which Martina is uh, moderating. So we're going to be doing a lot more content with Martina, which we really appreciate. Um, so thank you for coming in. Fantastic. Thank you for having me, Ryan.